I want you to see that Malachi is actually divided very, very simple. The entire, the entire um, book is really about two things, broken relationship and mending relationship. That's what it's about. And if you look at the very first chapter, I'm, I'm going to have to just sort of take us to chapter one and see if I can make sense out of chapters one stands by itself, two, three, and four uh, are the second box. It's really a two box book. It's not that complicated. The date for your entry sheet is around 400 BC. Some would say 397 BC. Malachi means my messenger. Uh, the Septuagint uh, refers to its meaning as an angel. Remember, the term melech is actually like a, a term for a, a messenger. The e on the i on the end, the sound of e on the end means my. And um, that messenger can be, by the time you get to Revelation, it can be the pastor of a church who's a messenger, or it could be the angel of a church that's a messenger in Revelation 2 and 3. Here, uh, he's a messenger in a very real sense. Um, it's interesting because he refers to, like, Levi in chapter 2, verse 7, as the messenger of the Lord. And that suggests that a person who witnesses on behalf of the Lord is like an angel. Here's what I want you to see. Biblically speaking, my job as a pastor isn't to tell you all kinds of great insights that I learned growing up in New Jersey. My job is to be a messenger for God. And to the extent that I do that well, I am used by him. And when I don't, I get in his way. And much of ministry is us working to stay out of the way of the Holy Spirit. That's really what it is. You show up, you open your mouth, and you hope you don't get in the way. Now, the other side of that is that my messenger is also the job of an angel. When an angel appears, they have basically one job. They're a mailman. Now, not all of them. Some of them fight and some of them defend and there are other things that they do. But in scripture, like Gabriel, when he shows up, his job is to simply articulate what God said. Not to evaluate whether or not it's compassionate enough or whether God should have said something different. Because we are living in a time now where more people in ministry want to rewrite the Bible to what they wish it said than just say what it says. Because what it says isn't always palatable. But it's not our job to be Jesus' PR firm. We're not on American Idol trying to get everybody to like us. What we're doing is becoming a messenger of God. I want you to zero in on the message that he gives. And the first box really describes the problems. This is broken relationship and this is the problem how did the relationship break and why is it broken and then of course what do you expect to follow the problem solutions we're hoping that the Bible's not just gonna bring us to the brink of hey you got a problem you sinner so that you can sit there and feel wretched about yourself the point is what fixes it? What mends the relationship? And so you get into God. This is going to be indictments. An indictment is when God says, here's what's wrong. Here's the problem. And then God will give answers. Those indictments lead to, to the Lord saying some specific things. Let's see if we can sort of take a look at the main problem that they have. When you come into chapter one, I want you to see that there are two priority problems that they have. Mark chapter one this way, okay? Malachi one, one through five is no appreciation. Malachi one, one through five, no appreciation. The priority was on what made their lives seem better, not what, uh, what God had done for them lately. So they become a little bit wrong about their priority. And I'm going to examine the text, but first I just want you to get a, a frame for it. So first problem, no appreciation. They don't appreciate. The second one in 6 through 14 is leftover giving. One of the ways they know that they're not appreciated is they're getting, God is getting leftovers. I'm going to tell you this from experience. In a marriage, when one of the two marriage partners doesn't feel appreciated. It is generally because they feel like they're getting the leftovers, not the prime spots. When you're coming home exhausted from the job 
and you're dropping in bed and barely able to give in to the relationship, the partner is going to feel like they're getting ripped off. Why? Because they're getting ripped off. But you're going, I'm working all day so I can take care of you. But really, that does, you know, at three o'clock in the afternoon when you're not there and you're exhausted at work, she's not feeling it. When, when you're out there working late, trying to do it under stress, he's not feeling it. So because you think you're giving something, remember that if you're not giving what they think that they're supposed to be getting, that looks like no appreciation. Let me see, uh, see if I can zero in. In verses one through five, it says, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi, through my messenger. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. And I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says, we have been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down. And men will call them the wicked territory and people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. Your eyes will see this and you will say, the Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. It sounds like he's wandering a little bit. So let me see if I can bring in some very tight focus. The opening statement shows the problem. The statement is, they walk around and God says, I have loved you. I've taken care of you. I have given to you. And their question is, well, what have you done for me lately? Wait a minute. I'm not feeling it. How have you loved me? And the first thing he says in verse 2, second half of the verse, is preferential treatment. I've given you better treatment than, than you deserved. Somebody else was in line to be the person of preference, and I put you ahead of them. I gave you preferential treatment. And then behind that, he says in verse 3, I gave you exceptional prosperity over your neighbors. I find it absolutely ironic that American Christians would fuss at God. We have, honestly, if you have money in the bank, any money in the bank, money in a wallet, and some change in a dish or a, drunk, a junk drawer, you are in the top 8% of wealth in the world. So let's just talk about what we're talking about. And we're fussing because, you know, you don't know the size of my bills. No, but you do, do have some choices about how you made them. And, and here's the issue. God is looking at it and going, your priority doesn't seem to be to understand what I've done for you. By the way, verses 4 and 5, I held your enemies from growing stronger than you. See, one of the things we don't take into account that God is doing all the time is stopping what could happen. You drove here this morning and you only know that there's an annoying lady who was going 27 on US 27 because she thought that was the speed limit. What you don't know is that God saved you from three accidents of people who were blind or drunk. They were coming at you and he, re he turned them off. You're going to get to have and see your guardian angel and that, that guy or that gal is going to be all beat up. And you're not even going to know how they got that way. Because you're going to go walking in like, hey, hey, good to see you. They're going to go, I am glad you're dead because you were killing me. <laughs> All right. My point is that you see what happens. You don't see the alternative. And so in verses four and five, he says, I don't know if you've stopped to look at this, but when I told you that Edom would not be strong against you, I broke them down. They were actually stronger than you and I made them weaker. They said they're going to rebuild. I keep knocking them down. I'm taking your opponents out. Um, when I was a kid and growing up in South Jersey, there used to be on Saturday morning the Dr. Shock Theater, which was horror, followed by roller derby. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen roller derby, but if you've ever seen roller derby, people get on uh, roller skates and go round and round and round and basically knock each other off the track in order to score points. And I don't actually know how they score points. I don't know if anyone knows how they score points. I just know that they like to fight and throw each other over the rails. And it was great fun. When you're eight years old, this is like cool stuff. Okay, here's what I do know. Teams would team up and they would decide who the strongest player out there was. They didn't vote them off the island. They flung them over the side of the fence. That's what they did. They'd come up behind them and three people would just scoop them up and dump them off right over the rail. 
And that guy would go flying out and he'd, you know, be all, he'd get a bloody nose and you'd be going, yeah, you know, and it was great fun for eight-year-olds. My point is simply this. God is busy tackling people who are about to hit you from the side and you don't see it. And you don't have any appreciation for what you don't know. I'm just going to say, you're, you're, you're great, all of you. You're fantastic. But I'm going to doubt that at seven or eight, you went up and sat down on your mom's bed and said, Mom, tell me how the water bill's going this month. You just turned on the water and expected it to come out and didn't figure there was any bill attached to it. Uh, I, I know some of you, even to this day, have no idea that there's an electric bill attached to the light you leave on all the time. It's just not something you think about. Why? It has been provided for you. So I want you to, when you zero into the first five verses, look at it this way. I've loved you. How have you loved me? We grow insensitive to what God provides in preferential treatment. He put us at the top of the list of a great many things. We got things we didn't deserve. We got exceptional prosperity. And by the way, uh, guardian angels taking a beating, keeping you here. God has protected you, okay? Can we step back and say, where would you use verses one through five? What kind of person are we addressing here? Where does this work in your life? Take one moment. I'm not, I'm not walking off the text. I'm asking you. Start applying it because we're running out of time and you've got to be able to do that. What do, you, what do you do with these verses? You can talk to people about 400 B.C. and Israelites and Judah and Edom, but I don't think that's going to change their life. What is God really saying here? Love is measured by a great number of things that are easy for us to, to look right past and just assume. We, we can walk around feeling entitled. The opposite of love is entitlement. And there was an entitlement that gave rise to no appreciation. And some of you are going to walk onto a college campus and you are going to be surrounded by an entitled generation that feels like they have the right to make up what words mean if they don't like them because they actually believe that if you disagree with them, that's hate speech because they don't have the ability to have the kind of rigorous conversation that we have from the freedom of, of disagreement. Let me go down now to the second one. Do you understand what God's complaint is? I'm a good parent and you're wiping your feet on me. That, that's the sense of verses one through five. Let's go to six through 10, uh, six through 11, uh, 14, I'm sorry. A, a son honors his father, a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where's my respect, says the Lord of hosts to you. Oh, priests who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar, but you say, how have we defiled you? And that you say the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you present the lame and the sick, is that not evil? Why not offer it to the governor? Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? But now, will you not entreat God's favor and that he may be gracious to us and treat us kindly? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. For from the rising of the sun, even to the setting of the same, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name and a grain offering that is pure. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you are profaning it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled. And as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. You also say, my, how tiresome it is. And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick. So you should bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, 
says the Lord of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. Okay, if you misunderstand who God is, you can, he sounds egotistical. This isn't just some rock star. This is the creator of everything that is. He's not being egotistical. He's telling the truth. When Muhammad Ali got up and said, I am the greatest, it was ego. When God gets up and says, I am the greatest, it's truth. There's a difference when you're telling the truth. He's going, look, I set up the system. You belong to me. I want you to understand that on your, our best day, we are servants of the living God. And because of that, when a servant gets uppity with a master, the master looks at him and says, hey, wait a minute. Who's running this place, me or you? So you see it. You seem surprised in verse 6. Look at it. You seem surprised in verse 6 when I say you're treating me badly. You seem to be looking at me going, wait a minute, that's not true. I'm not treating you badly. Have you ever had a, an argument with somebody like this? Where they are hearing something and you're hearing it, but you're hearing it differently than they think they're saying it. And it's going back and forth. I didn't mean that. I didn't say that. You didn't understand what I was saying. That's what's going on. Verse 6. You, you don't get it. I claim you're treating me badly and you don't seem to get how you're treating me badly. So let me give you five ways you're treating me badly. In verses 7 and 8, you're giving me inferior offerings. You're giving me less than you have agreed to give me. You're making it seem like you're giving me this when you're giving me that. You're cutting the sauce. You're changing the wine in the bottle. You're showing me that you're giving me the good cut of meat when you're swapping it with the bad cut of meat. You're basically falsely misrepresenting yourself. So the first way you're badly treating me is an integrity issue of just plain misrepresenting what you're doing you're gonna find that one of the deepest, hardest things in a relationship to overcome is when you look at the other person and you know they're not telling you the truth. You're gonna raise your kids and one day they're gonna look at you and they're gonna tell you something that you know is untrue and you're gonna struggle because without truth, relationship dries up. If we're just gonna sit here and lie to each other, then we might as well be in politics, okay? Honestly, the, the truth is that truth is what supports relationship. Remember this, love must be based on truth. Truth is not rooted in love, love is rooted in truth. That is the most, the foundation of everything is, this is what's true. Guys, we're, we're living in a time when people have been told, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as it works for you. Here's the problem, it matters what you believe. Let's apply it doesn't matter what, believe, what you believe as long as it works for you to the science of medicine. How do you think that's going to work? You know, if you think apple juice cures cancer, then just have at it. We will go to your funeral. Because you're going to sit there and tell us that you can change the laws of the universe by apple juice. You don't think you're going to run into 50 Christians that are doing just that? Go out and look on the web. I tried this root. It cures my melanoma. Not so much. In test after test, it really doesn't relate to that. But I felt it did. That's great. Thinking aspirin cures cancer doesn't make it so. The, we have to get to the place where we say, you know, the truth matters. The truth matters. Remember what this book is called? My Messenger. The truth matters. That's what it's, that's what it's about. The second thing I would tell you is in verse 9, ignoring your wrongs and seeking my favor anyway this is the kid who just lied, just cheated, just threw a fit, and now wants more allowance. That, that is exactly what this is. This is the person who just treated you badly but would like now to borrow your car. Do you, all, you all know that feeling when a person just says, they totally blown it with you, and now they're asking for a favor, and you're going, really? Is that what we're doing right now? That's verse 9. How can you treat me like this and then turn around and expect something from me? Yeah, I'm not thinking that's going to happen, God says. Now, I don't mean to be too hard, but I mean to be true. And when you get to verse 10 and verse 11, he says the third thing, you continue to observe practices that are empty because your heart's not there. That's what verse 10 says. You show up, but your heart's not there. And that has the direct effect of modeling the testimony of the living God. You are doing it badly because you don't care how you're doing it, and it's coming off badly. 
There are people who will come in, they will literally prepare their Sunday school lesson to go and deliver it in the car, on the way, they do it badly, and because of that, there's a kid who's growing up that believes this is a joke, who will grow up and be the next senator. We are getting what we grew, and we gotta take responsibility for the level at which we do. If you're gonna do it, do it well, or stay home. I want you to not stay home, okay? That's not really what I'm trying to get out of you. But if you're gonna do it, do it, do it to your best level. One of the most frustrating, does anybody else get frustrated when you're, you're on a team and people just are not holding up their end? I get frustrated in ministry situations when I'm killing myself to make sure I'm doing everything I can, but the rest of the people that have to do that in order to make it work, don't do their part. And I know that you're gonna feel that as well. And I know that God feels that. This is my reputation, my holy temple, and you guys are doing a slipshod job and it's coming off as on my reputation. And God says, that's just not right. Let's go down to the fourth one. Look at verse 12 and 13. He says, um, you're walking around profaning the table. You're saying the table's despised. And here's my real problem in verse 13. Underline the word tiresome. You are saying that it is too difficult and too burdensome to follow me. You're saying... Well, you know, the reason I'm not doing it, God, is because it's too hard. I don't want to hear that it's too hard. I made you, and I know what you can do. And you're telling me it's too hard for you to be honest? Do you ever have somebody tell you, like, man, I, I had a guy come in one time. <laughs> he walked in my office, and he said, I'm working at this place. If I mention the place, you'll all know the place because it's here in town. And they are just brutally hard. Do you know that if you come in five minutes late, you get points deducted? And if you get so many points, they fire you? And I said, so what you're telling me is your complaint is that they actually expect you to show up when your shift starts? Boy, that's really rough. I can't imagine people that would want to pay you for like being there. And they looked at me and went, why are you being so negative? I'm not. I'm echoing back what you're saying. What you're saying is you think people should pay you because of your intent to be there, but they don't get anything out of your intent to be there. You actually have to be there. Here's the thing. God's walking around and he's saying to them, you know what? You treat my standards like they're so burdensome, like they're so, you know, honestly, this is the person that comes home in the sixth year of marriage and goes, you don't expect me to just sleep with you, do you? I mean, really? Yeah, that's it. Kind of exactly what we said standing at that altar. You don't really expect me to like, you know, work a job and meet the needs for the family, do you? I'm busy playing a video game. Yeah, that's what I'm expecting. When people take the expectation that they agreed to and turn it into something like you're asking them to do something unusual, that's verses 12 and 13. You and, you and I agreed, I'd be your God, you'd be my people. I'll abate my wrath against your sin if you'll bring your goat. But here's the thing, take care of your goat, and make sure you don't bring me a lame one. You bring me a lame one and act like I should be happy to get it. I'm not a God of weekends. I'm a God of seven days a week, 24 hours. I want it all. And if you don't want to agree to that, then you need to know there's no other game in town since I've looked around and there's no other gods but me. So... This is the deal, guys. Look at the last one. Verse 14. Cheating me from what's rightfully mine does not escape my attention. Uh, attention. When, when I know what we agreed to, cheating me from what's rightfully mine, that doesn't escape my attention. Because I want you to know something. There are other nations. You're not the only one. And other people know that when I say I'm God, I am. Let me just say that verse 14 sounds to me like we get casual with our relationship with God and we just expect him to offer grace to us since we're such lovable creatures. We, we really do. We go, Jesus, you died for me and therefore I just know that I'm just going to go do whatever. I'm, I know I'm going to cheat on this test, but, but you know, Jesus, you're going to forgive me because you love me. Don't presume on God's grace. Don't do it. When I admit that God has become too small in my life and I've become too large in my own life, my pleasures, my needs, my wants, what can I do? 
As a child, Albert Einstein was fascinated with a compass and watching the, study, uh, the, uh, the, the steady uh, northward pull of the needle, he said that there was something behind the way that needle just moved to the north, something deeply hidden. He wanted to find out what it was. So as an adult, he devoted his life to physics in an attempt to understand the laws of the universe. He studied light, he studied motion, gravity, space, time. He studied electromagnetism, developed the quantum theory. He was awarded the Nobel Prize. His theory of relativity and expansion of the universe led to the Big Bang Theory, yet he wondered what was behind the universe. Could it be that this something that was hidden wasn't a what, but a who? Something about the beauty of the order of the creation kept bringing Einstein back to the idea that there must be something behind the universe. He said this, we're in the position of a little child entering a very large library filled with books of various languages. The child knows someone must have written these books. The child does not know and do, uh, do, uh, does not know how and does not know the languages that the books are written in. The child dimly suspects a mysterious arrangement to the order of the books but doesn't know what it is. That, it seems to me, is the real attitude behind the most intelligent human being that faces God. Now, Einstein was both an atheist and a theist. At different times in his life, he wandered in and out. What I want you to see, though, is when he grappled with the intelligence of the design of the universe, he could not conclude an atheist conclusion. However, when he dealt with moral statements in his life, he couldn't deal with theism. He is like a college professor. I don't want there to be a God. I don't see how there isn't, but I really don't want one. I'm busy running my life. I, I call that brutal honesty. Now, step back. Chapter one really says you don't appreciate me the way you should and you give me leftover stuff instead of what I deserve. And by the way, I know. By the way, I see. And you're not getting away with it. So Malachi has given eight directives to getting things back on track in chapters two through four. So I'm going to look at these eight directives to mend the relationship. I want you to see that in the very first directive is in verses one through four of chapter two. Directive number one is very simple. Turn or face the consequences. I was watching a YouTube clip this morning of a guy who was telling, giving a news broadcast on CNN and apparently a lady was watching him give the news broadcast, didn't see the car stop in front of her. He was standing alongside the highway. And the next thing that happened is the guy had to fl uh, flee out of the way as the car came and drove right over the camera. If you, if you don't turn around when the car's coming, you're going to get hit. You can stick your head in the sand all you want, but the rhino is still going to run you over. So he says, turn or face the, con face the real problem because everything else stems from one problem. I want you to zero in on verses one through four. Everything comes from one thing. Now this commandment is for you, O priest. So notice he comes at them, but he comes at their spiritual leadership. It starts with the spiritual leadership. If you do not listen, and if you do not take to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. And indeed, I've cursed them already because you are not taking it to heart. Underline, you are not taking it to heart. That's the problem. At the end of this book, do not get caught up in the symptoms. That's the problem. You don't take me seriously. You don't think I am who I say I am. The failure of a believer, the failure of a servant of God not to take seriously who God is, is the failure from which all the other problems will stem. When God is holy in your mind, it means he is distinct. When you are his servant in your mind, it means he is your master. When those things are not true, when you treat God like he's some friend of yours, but not the Holy One, and when you take that which is distinct and unique about him and trash it, or when you decide that you should be able to negotiate rather than obey, that underlies all of your other problems. 
This book has a good word to all of us. Behold, I am going to rebuke your offspring. Spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your feasts, and you will be taken away with it. Then you will know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant may continue with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Now, bottom line, face your problem. If you don't face your problem, everything that's going to happen that stems from it will happen. In other words, when God convicts, when God demands, there's a blessing in the demand. What's the blessing in the demand? What's the, what's the good side of conviction? Yeah, now you have to actually do it. Let's just put it this way. The blessing of conviction is choice. The blessing of conviction is choice. When I am convicted by God, I now have a choice to change my behavior. Without conviction, you could ignore your behavior. You could get too busy to see it. Let me, let me say it this way. God's conviction is not untender. It's a tremendous gift. Never push against the goads God is kicking you with. Don't. Ask God to heighten the tension of conviction in your life, not reduce it. Because by doing so, greater surrender occurs. And when greater surrender occurs, God is able to use your life in greater ways. Now, let me give you a second directive. And this one's in verses 5 through 7. I'm going to say it this way. Remember the past. Let, let me say it another way. It wasn't always cold in here. It wasn't always cold between us. Our relationship is on the rocks, but it wasn't always there. This is what I tell couples that walk in having trouble with each other. You didn't start there. You didn't pick this person to be the love of your life so you could torture each other for the next 50 years. That is not how this happened. So I need you to go back. Where did you walk apart from one another? Now, this is how he says it. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. So let's stop there. God's desire wasn't to make your life miserable. It was to give you life and give you fulfillment. That's the word peace. I, I, my intention wasn't to make your life hard, God says. I know, I know. You look at me like I'm making your life hard. My intention was never to do that. I wanted to give you fulfillment. And then he says, and I gave them to him as an object of reverence. So he revered me and stood in awe of my name. When I gave you a covenant that said, I will make you special and we will have a relationship, it was like a marriage. I, I walked into Israel and I put my arms around her and I said, I will make that covenant with you and it'll be very intimate and personal, but I want you to revere that covenant. If you don't revere that covenant, the whole thing breaks down. No marriage works unless two people agree to make it work today. It's that simple and it's that complex because you can't make somebody love you. And you can't make somebody stay with their agreements. That's why I'm going to demand, I'm going to plead with every one of you, marry a person of integrity. It's more important than anything else. If you don't marry a person of integrity, trying to get them to be honest with you about the commitment that they're making is beyond their ability. Okay? Find somebody who has integrity. Do not try to beat integrity into a person who's a liar. Okay? The second thing is, uh, I, when you go into verse 6, he says, True instruction was in his mouth, and unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He's talking about the priests. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many back from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge, and men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Look at verse 7, because that is your call. Every one of you are a chosen generation a holy priesthood, Peter says. Now take a look at this. What is your job? The lips of the priest should preserve knowledge. Your job is not to play PR for God. Your job is to say what is true in a compassionate, love-soaked, but nevertheless unbending truth. I can't make wrong right because you want me to. I can't change Thou shalt not lie unless it's you, but you're a nice person, so you can. I'm not going to bend the truth, but I am going to present to you the truth in love. By the way, if you don't speak the truth in love, it just becomes a, a weapon. So I want you to clothe. When you have hard things to say, clothe them in love, but say them. 
verse 7, for the lips of the priest should preserve knowledge. Then he goes on and says, and men should seek instruction from his mouth. It is not your job to make people want to do right. It is your job to make sure that you model and speak what is true in a loving way. If they do not seek truth, they will not have it, but it's not because you didn't say it, it's because they didn't want to hear it. That's why the second half of the verse is what it is. Men should seek instruction. It is your job, it is your job to maintain the standard in your life and in your words and in your winsomeness, but it is their responsibility to seek out truth. You know where I hang that? on a mama who's crying because she raised her kids to be godly and they chose not to be. It's not your job to make them what they are. They gotta wanna hear it. And then at the end it says, he's the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Would you, would you see your hands and your feet, would you see your life and your expression as a messenger of the Lord of hosts? When you turn away and snub in unacceptance a young person in your life, you can sour them and hurt them, and it will go on years after you're gone. I want you to know that when you get to heaven, some things that you didn't know you did right, God is going to call to your attention and give you crowns and rewards for things you didn't even realize what you did. I also want you to know that you are going to be cut to tears with things you did to other people that you did not really pay attention to. The kid who comes to you needing affirmation and you turn them into the cold because you got stuff to do. Just remember you're a messenger of the Lord of hosts. That's, that's your job. Now you go, wait a minute, that's the priest. Yes, yes, that is. But if you who are trained in the word are not the priests of the living God, can you tell me who's going to tell the word of God? Can you explain to me who's going to explain what's in Malachi if you don't? Which other kid in the youth group do you think was really bathing in Malachi today? It's not going to happen. So you're going to have to take that job on. I know it wasn't in the brochure. We lied to you. What can I tell you? You got bigger jobs going out of here than you had coming in. To whom much is given, much will therefore be required. Okay, directive number two then is go back and remember the past and remember who you are. Remember, Simba, who you are. Okay, you can put a little Simba picture right there in your Bible next to verses five through seven. Come on, somebody's going to do it. Just tell me if you do so I can see it and smile. Okay, <laughs> you don't even know who you are. Verses eight and nine, coming back to Malachi, are directive number three. Directive number one, turn or face the consequences. Directive number two, remember the past and who you are. Directive number three, I want you to reflect on the consequences of choosing bad leaders. I'm trying to hold it together right now. I'm just trying not to make any allusions to anything that could be dominating the news right now. Okay? Remember the consequences of choosing bad leaders. Okay? Verse eight. But as for you, you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by the instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. You priests have literally, by leading people in the wrong direction, have canceled, changed, annulled, beat up, destroyed the agreement I've had with them simply by your words. Right now, Nine out of ten people representing the Bible online seem to not have read it. They don't seem to know the God of the Bible at all. People are just mimicking words they saw, they, they saw from somebody. Well, you know, the law's done away, so now it's a free-for-all. Somebody wrote that to me this morning. Pastor, I'm so offended at what you, you said because I need you to understand the law's done away with, so we can just do what we want. And I wrote back and said... I don't know where you're coming from. Are you honestly believing that you're in a marriage that has no rules? Do, do you think that stealing is now okay, murder is okay, adultery is okay? Show me which laws were done away, because I think what he was trying to say is atonement law was done away and replaced by justification. But we still belong to God and not to ourselves. If that's not what he's saying, can you explain to me what the other 85% of the Bible is about? Because the 15% that tells me how to find God leads me to the other 85% that tells me how to follow him. 
And I'd like to know why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, see the law on how we should deal with this if the law was done away. I'd like you to explain those verses to me. And so I wrote the verses. I sent them back and I said, I'm more than willing to cop to any kind of offense if I said something badly or I said it without love. But your problem is the content of what I'm saying. And the content of what I'm saying is in the word. You have feeling, I have verses. Let's dance. What do you want to do? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to say we've lost our minds as a people. We're walking around going, but that doesn't feel right to me. Well, that doesn't make it wrong. Would you be open to the idea that the preaching used to be designed to make you feel conviction? And that per perhaps the conviction you're feeling is actually your conscience and you should attend to it. That should be probably part of, the, part of it. Number four directive is found in verses 10 through 17, and it's more complicated. So I'm going to stop after number four and take a break. But number four is the rest of chapter 2, 10, 10 through 17, okay? And it says, we have some issues. You must face the symptomatic issues, okay? Let me give you three symptomatic issues that you have to face. Directive number four, face the symptoms. Deal with the symptoms. Take some Tylenol, you have a headache. That's not the problem, but that's the symptom, okay? And he says, there are issues that, they're not the problem, the underlying problem we've already said. You're not taking me seriously. But the symptoms of the problem are three. Verses 10 through 12, intermarriage. Making relationships that don't honor God. Okay, let's just be straight up about it. Making relationships that do not honor God is a symptom of not taking God seriously. And I can tell you at various times in my life, those words would have convicted me thoroughly. 12 through 16, unfaithfulness in marriage. Not only are you intermarrying or making rules or making relationships with people that don't honor God, but unfaithfulness. You're using people in relationships that God gave you. Instead of cherishing the relationship, you're using people. And so this is unfaithfulness in marriage. That's 12 through 16. The third issue and this is symptomatic. I want you to notice that the first two are about relationships. The, sec the, the last one is about justification. It's this, adjusting truth. It's moving the lines that we've been coloring over. Because what we do is we color past the lines and then move the lines and then we feel okay about it, ourselves. This is adjusting truth, ascribing wrong as right, perverting values. America is caught up in a time where collegiately we are perverting values in order to catch up to the misbehavior. It's very difficult to make the case that people ought to walk with God if you're not. It's incredibly difficult to say that people ought to stay married if you don't. Now, I'm not telling you that every divorce is every person's fault. It only takes one person to screw up a marriage. And you could be the other one. I'm saying you lose your voice about the integrity of a marriage for a time when yours falls apart. Does that make sense? Bankrupt people shouldn't be giving advice on finances because right now people are not going to buy it. That's what I'm saying. Don't sit there and feel all condemned. If it happens to you, God will use you and there are places to pick up the pieces. But you need to know you can't be getting up preaching about how to have integrity in your life right after you've been caught as a felon. That's not going to really work. Nobody's listening. When a president can't keep his pants on, people giggle when he gets up and talks to young people and tells them that they ought to stay in school and not get pregnant. And Then keep your pants on. Okay? It, that's, people are not going to buy what you're selling if you don't live what you're saying. So come down to issue number one, 10 through 12. Let's go back to intermarriage. Do we not all have one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. Simply underlined, married the daughter of a foreign god. That summarizes 10 and 11, and what he says is, when I told you that these are not allowed, 
to you that this is a relationship you cannot have. The world sent you Balaam and Balak and said, oh yes, you can lie with our daughters. You can't. You don't belong doing that. If this were California, it would be you can lie with somebody of the same sex. You can't. You don't belong doing that. When God says this is the limitation, that's the end of it because he's the creator. And so he will literally step in and say, when you make lines in relationships that are beyond the lines I drew, it's not culturally significant. It's not a new avant-garde way of looking at it. It's sin. That's what it is. God defines right and wrong. When you define it differently, you're wrong since he's God. And when you get a preponderance of your entire generation to agree with the opposite of what God says, it's still sin. Most people, in most times, in human history, were wrong. The majority isn't the way you figure out morality. You don't vote on what's right and decide what's right through the polls. It's revelation that decides right. It's revelation that decides right. God uncovers the truth. That's what decides what's true. Okay? Second, as if intermarriage wasn't bad enough, unfaithfulness in marriage or using people in relationships that God gave us starts in verse 12. It says, as for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob everyone who awakes and answers or who presents an offering for the Lord of hosts. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears and weeping and groaning because he is no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But not one has done so who has a remnant of, his, of the spirit. What did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit. Let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. He is not talking about the legal conditions under which a marriage can be broken. He is talking about people treacherously dealing and trashing someone else. And if you've been in a home where there has been a divorce, I don't know of anything more devastating to a person's emotional structure than having the person who's been most intimate with them in life vote that they don't want them anymore. There is nothing more destructive that I have ever found. Honestly, the death of a spouse is easier than the divorce of a spouse. So he says, using people in relationships treacherously that I gave you, that gets under my skin. I hate it. I hate it. Can I tell you that if you've ever sat with a child whose heart was broken by their parents splitting up, you'll hate divorce too. See, God has to hear the tears and prayers of the rest of the woman who's sitting there saying, I've been faithful, I've done everything I could do, and he just took off. And it's, it's heartbreaking, and if you go through it, or if you go through it with a friend of yours, I gotta tell you, it will tear you up. Verse 17, there's a third issue. And remember, all three issues stem from the same cause. You're not taking me seriously. Here it is. You have wearied the Lord with your words. I'm tired of listening to you. That's what God says. Do you, you ever hear God say such a thing to people? I'm actually tired of hearing your prayer. Shut up. Here's what he says. How have we wearied him? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Where is the God of justice? He says, you're running around telling everybody that I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay, God loves us all. I hate listening to your words. Have you forgotten that I actually know what's true and that I do what's true? I am just, I'm not sitting up here going, well, whatever you want, just come to me with whatever you feel like because I'll just, I'll, I'm, just this, I'm just this very needy God up here going, please love me. I'm really not. I really made the entire universe and could remake it in a moment. 
I need you to understand that the, I'm a God of justice. And you're looking at me like any scrap you throw me, I should be okay with. It doesn't really work that way. I want to take a break, but before we go into chapter three and move on to the fifth directive, is everybody clear that the root of this is when we don't take God seriously, we end up choosing relationships that don't honor him, or we end up not handling people the way he tells us to, or we end up trying to be compassionate. Look at verse 17. You are not more compassionate than God. You cannot make okay what he says is not because you love people. You don't love them. Letting people believe that a lie is the truth is not loving. It just comes off as loving on the modern news. But it's not. So our job isn't to modify the word of God. It's to carefully, completely surrender to giving it the way he gives it. Never in anger, never with lacking love, but your love doesn't redetermine the truth. I think those words are necessary for our time, okay?